There is another angle to look at on Ephraim before we go any further. Did you notice there are at least two Israels? The entire 12 tribes are the nation of Israel. Under David and Solomon, it was the United, the United Monarchy of Israel. Under Jacob, who was renamed Israel, his 12 sons were the children of Israel. When Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, they were one people. But after Solomon, the nation was divided. The southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. They were actually at war with each other several times. The nation of Judah was of the tribes of Israel, but was not called Israel, because the northern kingdom was called Israel. When the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity, they were no longer named Israel. When the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity, they called them they they considered themselves as Israel, but they called themselves Judea. In this way, there came to be more than one Israel because Israel was divided. There is also more than one Ephraim. There is a people of Ephraim that never fell. They have been hidden from view. Let's take a look at these ones. David was an Ephrathite from the tribe of Judah. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 12. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. Ephrathite is another way of saying Ephraimite. How does this work? If we remember Rachel, Jacob or Israel's wife that died giving birth to the son Benjamin, she was buried in Bethlehem on the way to Ephrathah. Genesis chapter 35, verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said to her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Ani, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem is on the way to Ephrathah, which means bountiful. When Joseph was in Egypt, now Joseph was the older son of Rachel, and the other younger son, Benjamin, was his brother, right? So when Joseph was in Egypt, he had two sons, and he named the second son Ephraim, which means people of Ephrath. He said that it was because God had made him bountiful in the land of his affliction. Now this word is tied to where his mother is buried. She was buried in Bethlehem on the way to Ephrath, which means bountiful. Bethlehem means house of bread. So it was a house of bread on the way to a town named Bountiful. When David's grandmother, Ruth the Moabite, you'll read about her in the book of Ruth, and when she was taken into the tribe of Judah by marriage, because she married David's grandfather, the elders at the gate said this at the wedding. Ruth chapter 4 verse 11. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May Yahweh make the woman that has come into your house like Rachel and like Leah which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily in Ephrathah, and be famous in Bethlehem. 
Now King David was born in Bethlehem. He was of the tribe of Judah, of the town of Bethlehem, which is in Judah. The grave of Rachel was there, and the whole town of Bethlehem had an affinity to their co-patriarch, Rachel. They knew where her grave was. They found it there. And they also were known as Ephrathites, because Bethlehem was very near to Ephrathah. They were the actual people of Ephrathah, even though they were not born to Rachel. They had a spiritual attachment to Rachel and to Ephrathah. So now in Micah, the prophet Micah, which is much later, um, he wrote about Bethlehem, Ephrathah. He wrote a very famous prophecy Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travails has brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of Yahweh, in the majesty of the name of Yahweh his God, and they shall abide. From now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. So what does that mean? Well, in Matthew chapter 2, Starting in verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, and shall rule my people Israel. So they were quoting the prophet Micah. The Jewish priests and scribes determined that Christ would be born in Bethlehem by Micah's prophecy. And there is another prophecy which ties this together. Jeremiah was a prophet in Jerusalem leading up to and during the destruction by Babylon in 586 B.C., now here is a very famous passage from Jeremiah, chapter 31. But here is the complete passage. Jeremiah chapter 31. Thus says the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children, because they were not. Thus says the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping and thy eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, said the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, said the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised, as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented, and after that I was instructed. I smote on my thigh, I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Is, is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spoke against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, said the Lord. 
Now the Apostle Matthew directly ties this prophecy to the birth of Christ in Bethlehem and the slaughter of the innocents by King Herod. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel reap weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. This directly ties Christianity to the repentance and return of Ephraim to God. So, we have looked at um, Ephraim as the people during the time of Judges, the, the one tribe, and then they became Ephraim, the northern kingdom, and then they became Ephraim, the lost ten tribes of Israel, and then they became Ephraim, the redeemed, um, which are, they were scattered among the Gentiles, and then the gospel went out to the Gentiles. Um, that part of that is going out to Ephraim, but there's also the Ephraim of Ephrathah, ben Bethlehem, the people of Rachel's children, those who are killed in the name of Christ, the slaughter of the innocents. Um, Christians all through history have been killed for their faith. Uh, that is when Christianity seems to uh, shine the brightest. And that is another way of seeing Ephraim. Now there's one more way that we can view Ephraim that we haven't really spoken much about yet. And that is Ephraim as the Christian nations of today. How do we get to that? Well, we've already explained how Ephraim uh, represents Christianity, how the northern tribe of Israel called Ephraim was taken away into slavery and the uh, new Israel was brought in as the Christians who were a Judah and the Gentiles joining together under one head, um, the um, Day of Jezreel prophecy. So if we look back at Jacob's prophecy about Ephraim in Genesis chapter 49, we'll just read it and see uh, Joseph. So this is Ephraim and Manasseh, okay? Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. So he's a fruitful vine or, or a fruitful plant, planted by a well, and it's so fruitful it grows up over the well. It, it breaks out of its own borders, out of its garden. Okay? The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength. So a lot of people tried to stop him, but he was stronger and his military might was greater. And his arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel even by the God of thy father who shall help you, and by the Almighty who shall bless you with the blessings of heaven above, the blessings of the deep that lies under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, many, many children, 
The blessings of your father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors. Um, above the blessings of Abraham and Isaac. Unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separated from his brothers. Okay, so this is um, when you think of the Christian nations and the age of discovery and how the... Uh, Christian nations, when you think of the British Empire and Europe and um, Portugal and Spain and um, how they broke out of their borders. They, they, they were so fruitful and so many people born under them. They broke out of their borders and they went all over the world. They, they uh, colonized Australia, Canada, India, sort of, um, um, parts of Africa, America, South America. So that's the, the, the fruitful well is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the well of, of water that makes you never thirst again. And the fruitful bough taking the water from that well uh, grew up over its borders and overflowed and there was wars and there was a lot of fights over it and they just continued to conquer. Um, it doesn't mean that um, they were more righteous than other people or that they were greater than other people or more. It's, it's, it's so that the gospel would spread. Um, <clears throat> you know, when uh, Moses, through Moses, God said to the Jews, or not to the Jews, but to all of Israel, he said, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest. I chose you because you are the least. So it's, it's, it's nothing to say, oh, we're the greatest because of this. It's that God chose it to happen this way. So... When you look at the Christian nations, they have the power, they have the, the bounty of the earth, they have the control um, through America and Britain, uh, Europe, it's like, and even Russia, Russia's Eastern Orthodox, so they're also a Christian nation, and they have the power, and um, they are blessed, they, they're just uh, bountiful, and they seem to just only get stronger. So um, that is another way to look at Ephraim as a... Uh, now, does this mean that uh, they're all going to heaven or that they're, none of them are bad? No, it doesn't mean that. We're talking about from a world perspective. Remember, there's the, the spiritual and there's the physical. The spiritual is above, the physical is below. So... When we're looking at the physical, you can look at the, uh, the, you know, the rise of the British Empire and the rise of the American Empire. And yes, it is an empire. And, um, you know, but spiritually, it's the spread of the gospel over the earth. So, um, you know, the many other people that are not British and not European um, have also become Christians. So it's, it's, they're a part of that also. But when you're thinking of it from a historical perspective, you, it, it's hard to deny that that is the fulfillment of this prophecy through Ephraim. It's the Christian nations and the way the gospel spread over the earth. Now the gospel is spread over the earth and, uh, you know, it still continues, um, there, there's a more pure gospel spreading over the earth because a tainted gospel has been prevalent for way too long. Um, but that's another way to look at Ephraim, the Christian nations. Um, it's just Christianity, the fruitful bow by a well. You know, lately we've been hearing a lot of this stuff about the critical race theory 
saying, oh, the white man has to pay back the black man for the slavery. Um, that's a bunch of bunk. The, that's written by people who want to divide us and written for people who don't know anything about history. Slavery goes back right to the beginning of time in humanity. Um, slavery was pretty much industrialized by the Islamic caliphates. Uh, they were um, marketing slaves for centuries. Uh, many Europeans were taken as slaves. Uh, many from India, everywhere they conquered, they took many slaves. And this was a common practice that went back even further than that. And um, the problem was when, during the British Empire, slavery became more industrialized because the age of industrialization came along. They had uh, mass production of ships and machines and and everything was was speeding up with technology that was coming out and slavery became industrialized and the British Empire at that time circled the globe it was Australia Canada India uh, parts of Africa uh, um, America in in the beginning and uh, South America it was all part of, uh, you know, the empire, and British and Spanish empires. So um, at that time, uh, there was a Christian uh, lobbyist in Britain because the parliamentary system was developed in Britain. It's a part of the development of individual freedom and liberty because people were being abused by government and people were being abused by despotic kings and queens that would come along. So um, in order to protect themselves, the uh, people demanded a system of government where they had a say in it. And, and this slowly was developed into the parliamentary systems that we see today. And this came out of Christianity also. And it was through this parliamentary system, a Christian lobbyist group in 1833 uh, caused the uh, parliament in Britain to abolish slavery in the whole British Empire. So that means in India, Australia, Canada, um, everywhere that Britain was uh, the crown, slavery was immediately abolished. This was a new thing in history. The abolishment of slavery at that level had never been done. And then it was in 30 years later, in 1860, probably because the British had done it, um, the, the question came up in America. Um, the, the North colonies were British colonies. The Southern colonies were Dutch colonies. Uh, the Dutch had not abolished slavery. Britain had, um, America had a civil war over this, and the, uh, the non-slavery won. So, you know, for people to come along and say, oh, white man and slavery, white man abolished slavery. It was the first time ever that it was ever done. It's the white man abolished slavery. We didn't start it, we stopped it. And now that is why in white man countries like uh, Canada, USA, Britain, all over Europe, you see people of any color can be the greatest leader in the, in the country. They can be anything they want. They can have the education. They have just as much chance pretty well as anybody else. Now, of course, there still are some cultural problems, and these things don't go away in overnight, and there's always more work to be done. But there has never been anything like that anywhere else. I'm quite proud of that as a white man, uh, that we abolished slavery. We didn't start it. We, we stopped it. 
So don't talk to me about, oh, I owe somebody something. Um, what about all the white men that died to abolish slavery? There was many wars fought for freedom, and there was many wars fought over slavery, and many, many white people died to stop it. What about them? Where, where do they have all this that, uh, that's something better than what America has, or, or what Britain or Europe has? Show me something better out there that we should be jealous of. You know, I, I don't feel ashamed about all that. That's history. At that time, that was normal. And white man abolished slavery. They stopped it. And um, yes, there's a lot of issues around it, especially dealing with the native peoples. But... Um, it's not as simple and clear-cut as people make it sound. Um, you can't uh, blame the white man for slavery because the white man um, was actually uh, barbaric tribes at the time when slavery was big. And they, many of them were taken as slaves. And many of them fought against the slave traders. So, no, it doesn't fly. And um, with the Christian nations, you know, there was a struggle for freedom in, within Christianity. And this is where we get many of our principles of justice. One justice for all. A man has the right to face his accuser. A man has a right to be tried by his peers. All of these um, principles come from Christian nations. So, you know, get your history straight before you want to start talking about stuff like that because a lot of times people talk and they have no idea what they're talking about. You know, there still are a lot of cultural problems and the fight has to continue. It continues till this day for freedom, for the individual, for um, they use the elite are always trying to hang on to power they always have been and they always will be and they'll use racism to divide us they always do it and uh, we have to be strong together and we have to keep fighting the same fight our forefathers fought and carry on get, get, um, gaining new ground you know, the Civil War in the United States uh, over slavery happened in the 1860s. Um, it wasn't until the 1960s that Martin Luther King Jr. stood up and uh, for ending segregation. You see, these things don't... People don't just give these things to you. You have to take these things. You have to rise up in a righteous way and take them for for a right reason um, so uh, Martin Luther King is a perfect example of that where he took that for his people and said I have a dream that a man will be judged by the content of his character and not the color of his skin so he called out America for saying, okay, you say that all men are created equal, what about us? You see, this is a righteous stand for a righteous reason in a peaceful manner. And, and it's just to make a claim that cannot be refuted. And um, that's, not what, that's not what's happening today. What's happening today is crap. It's rioting, looting, burning. Burning down mostly black people's businesses, by the way, which is a horrible thing. It's it's insane, and it's not gonna it's not going to gain anything. All it gains is people looking at it with disrespect because it should be disrespected. Burning things down, rioting, smashing—that's not the way to go. Um, you know. A lot of the times, the um, 
wars uh, of these natures, uh, there was a, 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 an offense and a defense. And the defense won. They were defending themselves and other people. They had a righteous stand and a cause. And that's why they won. But uh, today, this is not a righteous stand. It's bull. It's just crap. It's racism. Plain and simple. Um, it's sad to watch, but uh, hopefully, you know, um, we can get back to something more uh, palatable pretty soon. That I would be behind 100% if it was something that was actually right. But um, this stuff that's happening now, it's, I, I'm not behind it at all because it's not right. It's hurting a lot of people. It's hurting innocent people who are the last ones who really should be hurt. You're, you're actually hurting the people that you're claiming to be helping, which is kind of ridiculous. So anyway, you know, it's when people rise up on the ground that was already won. If you look at the constitutional principles and the principles of fair justice, this stuff is falling by the wayside. And these are the things that need to be defended. These are the things that have been won and need to be kept. As long as we allow people to divide us and distract us from what is truly valuable, when we stand to lose it, and you, you don't want to see what it's like when, if we lose it. There, um, you know, people hate the white man because the white man's in power, but there's always been a struggle within the white man between uh, what is good for people and the elite who want control and it's still happening today but if you allow them to divide us by race divide us by class divide us in any way they can then we'll be fighting each other and not them and that's the way they like it all right so that wraps it up on our series about Ephraim that's not everything there is to know about Ephraim, but uh, it gives us a pretty good understanding about who Ephraim is and what they represent. This helps us to get a deeper understanding of the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is like a table of contents to the Bible. It's God telling us the end from the beginning and there is no other book like the book of Genesis it's, it's a phenomenal book when you really start to dive into the deeper meaning of it for example we have Abraham Isaac and Jacob Abraham was the father of they call him the father of faith and then Isaac was his son who he was willing to sacrifice and the son of Isaac was Jacob who wrestled with God and was renamed Israel and this is like a, an object lesson for us of the Trinity of God it's the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit the Father is Abraham the Father and the son is the one who was sacrificed, who is Isaac. And then the Holy Spirit is the man who is transformed by God, who becomes Israel. So we can see the Trinity displayed right there in the book of Genesis. These other people, like the sons of Jacob, are all um, object lessons for us as well, where... God has taken these people and made them all object lessons for us. And the entire Bible plays out around this theme. 
Now we skipped over the, be, the first part of the book of Genesis from the creation until Noah because when we look at that we are going to also discuss the other creation stories and there are some from the Sumerians and the Babylonians now most of those Sumerian and Babylonian stories are from the library of Ashurbanipal. Ashurbanipal was the last great king of the Assyrian Empire. He lived at about 650 BC and he built a library in Nineveh, in the city of Nineveh. The city of Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire were always thought to be uh, mythical things by the European community until the city of Nineveh was actually discovered in the late 1850s and that's when it began to be discovered it's a huge city and they discovered more of it and more of it until they finally figured out what it was that they found. And the library of Ashurbanipal was found in the late 1920s. And this was a huge library of uh, cuneiform tablets and other writings where these are where these Sumerian creation stories come from and other stories, the Anunnaki and all of that kind of stuff. So when we talk about that, I figured it would be, be better if we wait till we get to that time uh, in, after the Assyrian invasion and after the fall of Assyria and after we look at Ashurbanipal and all that had happened, then we can compare that to what was found in his library with the Moses and the creation story. So when we look at it, because there's a lot of arguments that, well, Moses got his story from them, but this is actually a thousand years after Moses, these tablets that they find. But the tablets have written on them stories from before them but that's the reality of it so we'll look at that later after we look at uh, the Assyrian Empire first when we're looking at the book of Genesis we're focusing more on the glory of God the story of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and God calling Abraham and God leading this family, this nation. Uh, he's going to lead them through Moses out of Egypt. And what, why this was done in this way and what it all means is uh, very um, fantastic. So in our channel, The History of God, we are still in the book of Genesis. We, we are just following some of these rabbit holes to get a deeper meaning of what we are looking at in Genesis because there's very deep meanings there that you cannot really see until you see the later history as we have seen with Ephraim. Now the next thing that we're going to look at in our next episode is we're going to take a look at Judah.